Hello, hope you can see this, if not scream out. So I'll talk a bit about our crate and kind of our road towards that, how we ended up with that from a workflow perspective. So I'm sure I don't need to give you the annual reminder about the FAIR principles, but here you go anyway, because if you look at them, it's not just those four letters. I mean, there's actual things that you, we are supposed to do to make data, not just fair for humans, but also for machines, as having a formal knowledge representation, for instance. So this is kind of the road in for why we're talking about here, to, about standards and about access and so on. So let's talk about reproducibility. There, it's well known there's lots of issues in reproducibility in general in science, uh, but I would also argue there's issues in computational side. You would think first of all, when you go computational analysis, it's all there, it's all on the computer. Yet when you report this in say here in metagenomics, you have to uh, list up all the tools you're using. And this is one of the papers that I think is one of the best one who's done it. I've never seen anyone as complete as this paper. But if you, if you, if you look for all the capitalized letters in here, there are actually software tools mint in here with some options and so on. But I cannot click run on this paper. It, it's not going to do the same thing for me as, as it did for them, right? So it would take me weeks, if not months, to try to re-implement the same workflow. There is a workflow in there, but I, I kind of can't see it, right? So luckily in this case, I have also added supplementary material as is now common. It's not just a zip file, it's a lot of code as well being shared on GitHub and so on. So the kind of the components are there, but you, you know, kind of not quite sure where should we start? Because again, you have lots of things to install and so on. So you're still kind of a bit at the loss. You still have a job, you're a bit closer to the goal, but still, and a computer of course cannot figure out more. This is a the little corner here. That's as much the computer can figure out which type of language have we got, right? Because it's not structured, at least not in a formal knowledge representation. So let's introduce workflows, which probably most of you have heard about since you're in this group, uh, but the kind of, that is the motivation. Why right? do you, you have all this code, but how do I get it to run, right? So uh, the workflow can help you with that. So as a kind of abstraction level that will explain what's going on. So you, if you have defined a workflow, you can also visualize it to look at it and share that with others. So there's a kind of step towards fairness here for, for humans in a sense, because you're, you're lifting up the actual analysis. But of course, there's also a practical reason why you may, why you may want to use workflows for, scaling and automation because you can now run this on the cloud and many nodes and so on. And also, as, as Maggie mentioned, the provenance capturing all the details, like if you see this workflow on the right, there's many different intermediate values you may want to have a look at, right? And to, to see what happened in the workflow. So the problem is everybody had this idea. So there's like almost 300 workflow systems. So when every time I show this slide, I have to update from the, this wiki page to list all the known workflow systems. There's always 10 new ones. So I'm sure some of you here now have a couple of extra to add to the list. So there's a bit of a large landscape of workflow systems. So one effort trying to come to some agreement among this is the common workflow language. We have Michael Cruz on the call, which you can ask more about, is trying to find the kind of minimum uh, common a definition for workflows, which we all kind of agree we want to do, which is I want to run some command line tools, pass some files around, right? Most workflow systems can do that kind of thing. And if you can do that in this CDL expression, then you can run it in many different engines in many different clouds and so on. So it's allowing you to be freed from a particular workflow engine and its limitations. And your analytical method is now possible to move between them. And this can, in a sense, be helped also for documentation purposes, but mainly is for execution, right? Because you now have portable execution of your workflow. So here's actually a Nature article from the same author, uh, Rob Finn in here, who's talking about how moving the CDL actually allowed them to basically collaborate with their competitors because now they could talk the same language again. And if we look a bit further into that in the CDL case, when you say I want to run step A and step B on the left here, you're actually referring to separate tool definitions on the right. So they are separate resources that are defined separately. That means they can be reused in many different workloads. So you have these tool descriptions, tool wrappers that says, 
which command line do I want to run with which arguments? And which container can I get that software in? So now you don't need to install that software. You know uh, how to get the software installed as well. So that's kind of the mature workflow system way. Others are more close to where you're running it. So if we have the CDL workflow, you can think of it also as documentation. So here's one project we did some, is it four years ago now? The CDL viewer, which can take this and visualize it. So here you can look at the workflow in that definition. It's a very simple one with two steps in this case. And you can look at it and see the definition. In this case, there's not much documentation. But if there was, you can also access that in here. And crucially, you can also convert it to other different formats, like that picture you saw there. So we've already we're introducing new types of digital objects from one single workflow, which we saw was a very simple one with just two steps. So if we look about that case of the viewer here, we now have the diagram we can possibly get. Maybe you convert it to some turtle format or maybe you want to just use this permalink system as a way of getting to the workflow because you don't trust the URLs at GitHub because you see we made an identifier that's independent of where it is coming from. But then you also have these links following on to these sub resources and then the containers and, and then there's no more. We can't go any further, right? Because it, we don't know more about this tool, at least not from what is added in this workflow. There's no additional annotations. Now, fair to say with CDL, you can add additional annotations and documentation, but most workflow system, this is the level you can get at. It's sufficient to run the workflow, but it doesn't tell you why you want to run the workflow or where does it fit into the research process. And this is one of the ideas that led to the development of the research object concept. So this again is almost 10 years ago we started with this, now more than 10 years. The idea is to replace that uh, textual uh, publication you saw there, the, the PDF with all the text, to augment that with all the digital resources that are actually used in science behind. We should not keep them trapped on our laptops. They need to be promoted up and so on. And people have become quite good in sharing these things, but they are kind of spread out. So in different repositories and so on. So the idea of a research object is to also bind them together. If you see in the top corner, adding links and types and so on. And if this is linked data, then it's also machine readable. So you can go and pick up the workflow, for instance, if that's what you're looking for. So I'll skip all the 10 years of history, which you, you can all go and explore in the archives if you're interested in that. And we'll talk about how we're doing it today with our crate. So here I borrow Peter Sefton's slides, which are much more straight to the point about how uh, our crates are working. So basically, it's, our crate is a self-described data set. So it's a collection of some stuff and it's in the linked data uh, document. And that gives you the context and typing and so on. My, what kind of things do you add into it? It's not just CSV files. It can be anything. It could be things in the world, right? It could be instruments. It could be workflows, as I mentioned, or it could be uh, other things that, as long as you can identify it somehow or at least describe it somehow. Now, the way you do that is that you have a machine readable description in JSON-LD, and here you can do things like this cryptic file name has a description, right? So this is using his property as an example, uh, but you can imagine this happening just as well coming out of an instrument because you have these exotic file formats coming out and you want to augment that with just some additional metadata that wasn't there before, but to give you some uh, explanation. And here you see the human readable side of that. So once you have that structured data, you can also render it and show it. And in fact, we save that rendering as an additional file next to it. So the R-Create is not just machine readable, it's also human readable. So the metadata is still accessible for those who don't speak uh, JSON fluently. Now, there is a bit of provenance that would be good to include when, when you know it. For instance, that you have used some instruments, you have used some workflows, so certain people have been involved and that you can add into the our crate as well. And then these are again, things that you can explain uh, as little or as much as you want. And then you can package this up because the base case is that we have just a bunch of data and then you can with the metadata on the side, package it up and save it and send it however you want or just put it on the web. So it's kind of neutral to how we store the research object, it is, uh, it's just a metadata holder in a sense that is flexible enough to many different ways of storing and publishing it. 
So I'm going to do the same thing again, but my way, which no one's going to understand. So here's going to be the Jason take on it, because there's going to be some questions about that later on, possibly. So here we go again. So there's a special file called the rcreate metadata JSON. That's where we keep it. So in the base case, we're just on the file system, right? We're not necessarily on the web yet. And in there, you have the different blocks of things you're describing. Now in the R-Create specification, you can see what kind of things you can put in there. And that's basically what our specification is. It's just a set of these kind of templates of JSON blocks that you may want to add. But actually it's JSON LE. So it is linked data, but kind of by stealth, like you don't have to know that much about it. So we're trying to keep it mostly hidden and that uh, you're not gonna sit there and build a graph or whatever. You're actually doing that, but without thinking too much about it. And the core vocabulary we're using are schema org. So schema org is well known for web developers because that's what is used for marking up web pages for, for your favorite search engine to figure out structured things about it. So you could think of this as Google is in control of my data, but no, it's not about that. It's about having a good set of uh, basic types that you want to start with. Like all those things I showed in the picture, people, organizations, data sets, images, they're all in there. It, we know how to describe these things, right? It doesn't know about, you know, x-rays or, or genome sequences, that kind of thing. But you can specialize this. Like bioschemas is a specialization doing this for biological types. So there you can talk about genes, for instance. But this is just uh, the starting. Now here you see a bit of the JSON. So the only magic bit is the thing on the top. That's what makes it possible to parse it as linked data. The rest are just boring JSON blocks. So we first have the self description. So the Arcrate defines itself as being an Arcrate, which we think was a bit important. So you know what you're talking about. And in, in fact, it's a version of the Arcrate so that we know which specification you're following. And then we have the big block in the middle, which is the, the core data set. That is the collection of things. Now, those might just be some files. There might be some some uh, persistent identifiers out there, or there might be something further nested on. And then you have some further description about who made this collection. Why do you see we have author, publisher, citation. Now notice those are very given by identifiers. They're not given as text, right? So we have identifiers in there. And then those follow on uh, below. So there's just, just a flat list of all these different entities in the R crate. So the graph is kind of flat if that makes sense, right? And here's how it works, right? Because you're just, if you follow that link, you will find another block that defines this ORCID identifier is actually a person and that's the name. And there's an affiliation to an organization, which again has an identifier and here's uh, its name and so on. Now, the crucial thing about this is that we can reuse the identifiers that already exist. So this is the ideal case where someone has an ORCID identifier, the organization is in the ROR registry, but many times it's not that beautiful, right? We know that there are, you know, students, for instance, there are people who don't work in academia, who don't have these things, but you can describe them exactly the same way by, by using the other identifiers they have, or you can mint a local identifier if it, and that's an entity that only exists within that horror crate. But of course, if there is a persistent identifier, you should use that. So that JSON is kind of, well and good, but not everybody wants to work with that. And particularly the programmers, they like libraries. So we have a set of libraries to work with that. And then we also have tools, which I'm going to talk you through that are a bit more interactive and different ways of using our crate. Uh, for instance, if you just go back to that core base case of you having a bunch of files on the desktop and you want to just describe them, there's a kind of like starting to collect metadata very early on. You don't even know where you're going to publish your paper. You don't know if you know maybe what you've discovered yet, but you want to start collecting it while you're going along. And then you can use something like the Scribo, which you run on the desktop or connect it to your uh, Microsoft OneDrive. And you can make these same kind of entities as I showed you before, but interactively, right? So you're now filling in a form basically, and you're making the exact same metadata uh, step by step, and it's saved in the same format. And because it's general purpose, this can also edit any of the R crates you might have received from somewhere else and show it in the very same way. So that's an easy way in. And I said, the, the, I'm arguing that FAIR is not just machine readable. It needs to have the human in the loop. So once you've done that, you can kind of convert it back again to an HTML page that you save next to the JSON file. 
So here's one of those. And here you see uh, these fields are listed out in a kind of human readable way. We don't know much more. It's still kind of like a kind of debug mode because we, we just see the property names and so on. But it's certainly much more easy to navigate than this JSON file. And the nice thing is that even though this is a static HTML page, it's not on the web, it could be you know, on, on your memory stick or whatever, you can still interact with it in the sense that you can go into the different entities and see the metadata about that. So here's the ORCID, for instance, right? Now, this example was coming from digital humanity. So here, there's no workflows in sight as well. So we, we're trying now to widen out to not just talk about workflows because we're not going to get everyone to do workflows because that's not the kind of science they do, right? So here, for instance, is uh, cultural heritage records being collected in Australia, Asia, where they are particularly looking at endangered languages. Maybe there's just a few hundred people left in the world who speaks that language. So people have gone out and collected recordings, written down, transcribed, and so on. So it's very interesting because you have many different contributors just to one record, and they have different roles and so on. So there's a lot of metadata coming out of maybe just three different data resources. So in this case, a picture and an audio file and some text around it, right? And the paradisic portal is one that is doing all that, but based on the RL crate. So while you can just look at this as finding things and you, you see all these contributors and so on, and you also have metadata about the metadata who did the digitalization and so on. All of this is actually fed from an hour crate. So there's a little debug button, which I don't know why they haven't hidden yet, but you can click that and you can see the actual JSON is all in there. So here you see each of them described, right? So our crate here is basically under it. It's, it's just the way we store the metadata. And so it's, you can think of it both as an exchange uh, format as an array of storing things. So that brings me to the argument of using our crate in repositories, which we are now working with Dataverse, and of course in Workflow Hub itself. We're talking to the open air and other EU projects. So this is the idea of our crate as a kind of holder for metadata, right? So that you can hold it in there and avoid the vendor lock locking. And this allows you to move between the repositories and also a kind of persistence thing. You see there I had that HTML file, which means that even if, you know, in 20 years, no one knows how to read JSON anymore, I can bet they will know how to read HTML, right? It's already got 30 years running, so that's not going to disappear very quickly. So you're, you're not kind of lost in some uh, Neo4j database or something. It's the, the metadata lives there with your data. That's the idea of that. So now let's look about how we're doing this from workflow, because that's kind of our project in uh, in Manchester and in EOSC Life, which is the Workflow Hub, which is a project for capturing workflows and sharing them and uh, making them available and describing them a bit better than just what you have in the little files. So let's look at one example. Here's a Galaxy workflow that has been shared and uh, here's a picture of it and there's some description. Not that much metadata at the moment, but there's a few, right? So already it's a bit more richer than what you would get from the workflow because we have some explanation and links and so on. Now, if you download the R-Crate, all the metadata will also be in there. So we capture the work metadata in the R-Crate, but we also capture additional things because we want to support many different workflow systems, which all do things in slightly different ways. We do a conversion, right? So we convert the Galaxy workflow from their native format to the CDRL format, but in this time you can't run it. It is just a description, it's, it's an abstract workflow. So it still has all the steps, but it doesn't say what to do in each step, right? Because porting that over takes a bit more time. You have to do all these parameters and so on, which is a bit more baked into the Galaxy system. Now, this is maybe a bad example because Galaxy itself is working on CDRL support so that you can, actually do this within Galaxy, but now we're doing it from the outside. So if someone's given us a Galaxy workflow, let's see what we can get. And then we also get the bioschemas information about this workflow. So that's the kind of higher level detail about the workflow, the title and the author and that kind of level. And then we pull that together in an hour crate together with, of course, the original definition, so you can still run the workflow. And that's what you deposit in the workflow hub and we can give it a DOI, right? So now you have, uh, register this workflow in, in the workflow hub. Now I said deposit, but it might as well be registering because they often live somewhere else, this workflow. Uh, and there could be many different types of workflows. And that's why we have this kind of common path in to keeping the metadata. And then we have room for other things to fit into our crate as well, like 
we can add in tests, for instance, which I mentioned. And then when you have this kind of uh, our crate, you can run it. So it has uh, one tool that can do that. And later, Laura is going to tell us about the web for execution service, which can do this in even uh, more detail. Now, I mentioned tests. So if, if you were to run a workflow continually for testing, it would be good to know what test inputs to use and so on. So if you augment our query with these details, you become a workflow testing our query. So it's now is kind of enriched to know not just about the workflow, also about how you could run it automatically, right? Uh, more like a kind of unit test, you can see it's still working because these workflows, unfortunately, they, they do stop working after a time. This is a bit ironic considering their name, but it's because of these dependencies and other things in the world and the way that our computational infrastructures keeps changing, right? So even if you're running on the cloud, what is one type of cloud instance today might change in the future. And that's why we have the system of testing of workflows. Now, what about the computational tools? I mentioned these tools that you're using in workflow. You can think of workflows of just composing these tools. And how can you describe them in our crate? So in our crate, we do already say how you can just use, I use some software, right? Without saying how, you can just add them straight in. Uh, but then you haven't given any details about how you use it and also what is the form of the workflow. So here's in the BioXL project, uh, we are making something called building blocks. So we're wrapping these uh, kind of tools, but for molecular uh, dynamics and that kind of, simulation of molecules at an atomic level, which is computationally really expensive. And therefore you, you often do want to use things like GPUs and even uh, HPC uh, supercomputers to run it. Now, here is a problem of moving workflows around, right? Because if you try something locally in your laptop, but then you're later gonna run it on the supercomputer, you're not going to do it at the same level. You're not going to do it at the same workflow system even, right? So you need this portability of the tools between workflow systems and beyond just what can be done with CDRL. So we here we have built all these wrappers of the tools that then have Docker containers or Conda packages or different ways of installing the same tool that all work the same way. And that means they can be used in many different workflow system, which you see on the right, in the same way. So you have the same canonical workflow expressed in pretty much the same way using the same tools, but in different languages and different workflow systems. And that's why it's important to have the same building blocks in order to do that. Otherwise, you're gonna have different number of steps. You're gonna have different configurations and so on. So this kind of unifies that across. And here we have this multiple of digital objects again appearing, right? So one tool is not just one thing and have many different appearances begging for identifiers, right? So let's look about workflow run. I won't talk too much about that because Laura is gonna give us all the nice details about that. But uh, again, of course, the workflow is a software. So of course you can just describe, I ran a, soft, I ran a workflow, right? But it doesn't tell you that much because Laura will tell us more about how the workflow can flow through this whole life cycle and how you can collect information at every step along the way, basically, and know more about the workflow and make many different our crates along the way. And here's a, kind of, a, a brief list of things, which I'm sure we will expand upon about what kind of things you could be collecting and should be recording from a workflow. Because it's only when you run it, you know many of these kind of things, like how much memory do you need for running this workflow, right? Because if you needed a supercomputer, then there's no point in trying to run it on your laptop. So let's do a brief stint into regulatory sciences. So uh, this was the user case that come into us from, from the US, from the FDA. So they have, uh, they had this issue where the people are now, uh, especially pharma companies and so on, are using computational methods for as part of doing personalized medicine. So for instance, you have a cancer cell and then you, you're doing some analysis on uh, the genomes and then try to figure out which treatment should you use, right? Now, this of course has to be regulated and that means they have to verify that you're doing, it doesn't make sense what you're doing computationally as well. And they had the problem of people just submitting these kind of textual things like we saw before. And they had, again, weeks ahead of them trying to build a little workflow. So the biocomputer object is a separate initiative that uh, I'm also involved in, which is trying to formalize the kind of the purpose of the workflow. And 
the where is the workflow meant to be used? And they're doing that by describing these different domains that is separating out uh, parts of the workflow for more like, not from a computation perspective, but more from an explanation perspective. And that is their own uh, JSON format that is serialized as a, uh, well, it's a JSON, but here you've removed all the ugly brackets, so it's almost readable. And this is an IEEE standard now, that, so this is its own, own thing, and it, it focuses only on that thing, right? There is some mentions of software and so on in there, but it kind of stops there. It doesn't go into detail about who's the author about the software or where did you download this data from and so on. So there is a kind of role for our creator to fit in here on the side as a kind of glue that is an alternative metadata view. So you can have the BCO, the JSON on the right there that explains things, but you can also have the R created then for each of those things says, where did they come from? Who did, who made it? What is the version and so on? So you can fill in the blanks and have an alternative view. And this is a way of showing how we don't want all the metadata in our crate, right? So while you can extend that JSON, you're not trapped with just schema.org where you can add in other vocabularies and so on, of course, and we do that many times. Sometimes it makes more sense to just keep it on the side like we did in this case. So you can have more than one metadata file describing somewhat the same thing. So that's an important aspect. Now let's look about another use case. Which is if you have a lot of data citation, there's something happening in earth sciences a lot when you have uh, hundreds of images you're reusing. And then again, it doesn't fit into that citation list because you're going to use many pages of your PDF just to list all the data you use. Our grid is can be used as an intermediary. Uh, and that's something we're working with the AGU on uh, uh, something they call the data citation reliquary. Right, so as a kind of intermediate for a large data citation. Now, I talked about earth sciences and I'm gonna think four dimension. What does it mean that the fourth dimension is time? Right, we already have a way in our creator saying where's the location, but I was not specific for those actually doing earth sciences because they don't want to know, oh, it was in a city, why right? they want to know the, the length and the width and the the height even, and the, the time. So that's what is called the data cube. So they're specializing our crate to cover these kind of things and add in the data that has been recorded in that. It could be biodiversity, it could be better, all kind of earth science data can be described with that common metadata. And then they diverge depending on uh, which domain they're in. So you see there is a kind of set of profiles of our craze, right? We have this commonality of some things like how you to represent people and so on, identifiers, the structure, of course, but you can have this, there's already a whole tree of these uh, types of our craze forming, which specialize our craze. So they are almost like types of our craze, but I don't want to call them types. They are more like duck types because they're more like, uh, informal agreements about how to do things rather than strict schemas to say must be like that, right? But it's not a one or the other. So here's how we did the workflow our crate that I mentioned before, the one that uh, we use in the workflow hub. So, so here we have specialized this specification by saying, actually, you must have a workflow in there. Obviously, it's not a workflow our crate without a workflow. Right? And it also says things like there, there should be a diagram, right? So there's a few things like that. Now we just wrote this text tree really like this first because that was easy enough for developers to have a look at. But of course we realized this was not, it, it is a bit informal, but it is it's good enough to get started, right? But now that we're formalizing how to express these profiles. So uh, we now doing the, a profile crate. So of course we're eating our own dog food. So how do we make a profile of an R crate? It's another R crate. So this is a separate R crate that says, actually these are the kind of things you want to have in here. Now, again, I'm showing you the JSON, which I shouldn't. So I'll show you the, the rendering of this. And here we see, uh, we are just putting together in a flat bike. So here is the workflow execution service that Laura mentioned. And uh, here we have, uh, different types like the computational workflow said should be in there. So now we have kind of moved towards machine readable, but this is not something like a validator can use because it doesn't say computationally, how do you do this, right? It just says these are the things, right? So we are a kind of light level formalization. And the purpose is that 
a computer can use this if they go and pick up the thing they're looking for. Like for someone, if someone is looking for the list of licenses, they can computation go and do that. If someone is, like in this case, there is an actual validator called check my crate that has its own file format, which we have referred to here from the profile. It can go and programmatically look up what is that address, right? So you have this kind of intermediate map that can point to many things. Now, this is quite powerful because we can now have many schemas, right? We're not trapped in one way to do it. So if someone makes a JSON schema for this, we can just add it in here, right? So we can have more than one way to formalize it. Of course, you have to try to keep them consistent for it to make sense. So this brings me to, to the, the last bit. This is a consideration for fair digital objects. So how does our crate fit in there? Now, it does sound like our crate is a good candidate for capturing the metadata. You've seen this diagram probably about the fair digital object. Now the our crate can be one way of describing the metadata for different kinds of things, right? The persistent ID infrastructure, we are kind of already, we know that exists. We have the handle system. We also use permalinks to the W3ID a lot. Like that allowed us to do things like that CDRL example, right? Where we have automatic identifiers for every file in any Git com commit that has been registered, right? We're not registering them. They are already formed based on the identifier itself. And of course, a collection, our crate is a collection. It could be a collection of one, but it, it is a collection. So you can express a collection as an our crate. So it does look like it's fit in and the kind of the things at the top is ways we could store it, right? Now, this is kind of like, I would say 50% FDO, right? Because you, you have to be quite straight on your path in order to actually achieve a fair digital object, right? Like, because if I make an our crate that has, you know, some local files in there, or it is referring to things that you cannot access, then it's not really fair, right? So we need to have additional constraints and that is the fair our create profile, which we're forming now as another set of constraints that says exactly how should you store and publish your our create. So now we want to close those doors of where you want to put your our create in order to actually make them uh, appear in the same way. And when I was discussing this with Herbert van der Sompel, he was saying that actually you can already do this with fair sign postings. You might have seen he posted about this on the mailing list. I had problem prodding him to actually write it down on paper. He's now written it down. So, so there's something called link relations, which has been in HTTP for ages. And the, and the fair sign posting is just saying, if you use only those, you can basically cover Oh, no, it looks like fair digital object, doesn't it? You can have the identifier by site task, you can have the type as type, the metadata is described by, and then you can list the things inside as an item. And then there's this new thing called a link set, which is a way to, to get this out programmatically. Uh, I'll show this in a tiny bit uh, later, but we, well, if you look at the slides, there's also the details of how this actually works on the HTTP level, which I won't go into now. So I will not go into that now. So let's look about the overflow R crate. Uh, how are we doing this in the overflow hub? So this is the picture today, where right? we have DOIs, which goes to the overflow hub, and then you get an HTML page. Job done. Well, that's the landing page, right? So that is the human readable one. There is computational readable information in there, like this, the bioschemas markup I mentioned, which you can access programmatically if you know how to dig into the HTML, right? But it's not ideal because if I wanted to access things programmatically, uh, it's it's kind of uh, just one way to do it. That doesn't give me the metadata right away. Now we have this R create a zip file, so which is that download link you have up there. So maybe one easy way would just to say content negotiation, which you might have heard about, where you can send an extra header saying, actually, I don't want HTML, I want a zip file, and then you get that. And inside it. On a good day, there is the R crate. So in Workflow Hub, we always have the R crate in there, the same metadata as you have here, and of course, all the things that make up the workflow. Which you saw before, it's not just one file because it could be many files that make up one workflow. Uh, or it could be you want to access directly the R crate, and because you only care about the metadata, in which case you're saying, I want to JSON LD. And actually, I want it to be our grade. Now, actually, this is the only json we support, so you shouldn't need that. But I mean, there's potential other ways to represent the metadata. Our grade is just one way to do it. Now, if we do this in the fair signposting way, 
you can skip that intermediate, right? You don't have to actually download the JSON ID. You can just look directly at the link headers and you can find the kind of top level metadata and then you can represent, uh, well, this is the information you would get in the JSON ID, but if you do it in, uh, in the, the fair sign posting way, you can get it directly in the first response, right? So you can get them directly in there as link headers that give you the identifiers for the license, the DOI back again to that, the type and the links to the metadata. And there could be more than one as I said, right? So there could be that BCO for instance, another way of describing uh, the workflow. So this is the way we're thinking in to as a way of doing it very lightweight, always HTTP, we're not changing anything. We're still doing some, uh, the DOIs here, but we're not we're not adding lots of new things around it. We're just using the existing HTTP infrastructure for the for getting to it programmatically. And then, as we were talking about this, we had this problem of all. What about all these other things we talked about? Well, that's the thing. Do we also want to formalize those? To what level do we formalize them? Do we are we making permanent identifiers for each little file that we have in the workflow? Are they or are we happy to do it? in like that CDWL viewer way where you can address them through a permalink. Do we capture all these work example ones of a workflow? Now, now you have lots of little files inside there again. Uh, there's different visualizations. Those are kind of operations you do. There's all this tool definition, which is a whole talk in itself about how to capture and describe tools. And then all the way down to software packages. And ideally we should get to software citations, right? You would think it was easy to go from a workflow to get the software citation about what is used in there. But in order to do that, you basically need to have that complete path from top to the bottom. And that needs to be baked into the metadata along the way. And so what kind of lessons have we learned from this? So workflows themselves are multi-headed beasts, right? They come in many different shapes and flavors and they come with minimal metadata, but you can mine some of that out and we need to unify that, that's what we're doing. And then we get these derived resources and workflows themselves can have sub components, like you can have one workflow inside another. There could be these tools, as I mentioned, they might already be on the web or be on the gate. So they have already identifiers, but they're not like very good identifiers because they might change underneath your feet. And so you need to snapshot them, uh, maybe give them some persistent identifiers and so on. Or could be people have not been that well. They still are just operating on the disk and they want to just upload as is. So in, in the Workflow Hub, for instance, we support both of those ways in. And then finally, there could be existing digital objects that are out of our control, like what the workflow is using. That is, is part of how the workflow is made. We cannot change those containers. They, all, they already have the identifiers or don't have any identifiers depending on where they live. And again, the whole story for tools and so on. And the workflow ones, they do show all the details, maybe too much detail sometimes. So you need explanation and context as well there. So that's all the things for me. And here are all the other people who helped me come to that conclusion. So here's the r -Crate community. You can join us in GitHub issue number one, and then we meet twice a month. So that's it for me.